Welcome uh, everyone to WACB webinars, our distinguished uh, biomedical engineering webinar series hosted by the World Association for Chinese Biomedical Engineers, WACB. So my name is Zongmin Li. I'm a professor from uh, the University of Arizona. Here is early 6 a.m. in the morning in Arizona, so my morning greetings to you all. For the webinar, my, our speaker will present for 40 minutes, followed by Q&A for 20 minutes. Uh, during the presentation, at any time, uh, you don't need to wait to the end. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of, of your screen to submit your questions. Now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Zipei Liang. Uh, I have known Dr. Liang for a long, long time. Uh, for 17 years, we have been working together for grant review every summer. <laughs> Zipei is a dear friend, and it's a lot of fun to be with. Uh, so Dr. Liang is uh, currently the Franklin Wurtage Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So his research is in the magnetic resonance imaging and spectroscopy, ranging from spin physics, uh, single process and machine learning to biomedical applications. His work has been recognized by numerous awards, including uh, Greenfield Award from a Medical Physics, Whitaker Biomedical Engineering Research Award, NSF Career Award, uh, Henry Magnaski Scholar Award and the University Scholar Award from his own institute, uh, Otto Schmidt Award from IFMBE, uh, Takelik Achievement Award from IEEE, uh, relevant to Wackby, he was also the Savio Distinguished uh, Lecturership a uh, couple of years ago. Dr. Liang is a fellow of IEEE, ISMRM, and MB. He was elected to also to the International Academy of Medical and Biomedical Engineering. Dr. Liang is very, very enthusiastic about serving professional societies. He was president of, of IEEE EMBS from 2011 to 2012, and also received its Distinguished Service Award in 2015. Here you go, Dr. Liang. So I will unshare my slide. Okay. Now you put up yours. Look good, Zipet. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you for being here, sharing part of your weekend with me. I also want to thank Zhong Ming for the very kind introduction, and Professor Bing Mei Fu and Professor Agu for the opportunity to speak here. As you know, the Rugby Rugby Business Series has featured many outstanding speakers, sharing the stage with them is a great honor. As you can see, the title of my talk is Label-Free Molecular Imaging Using Spins, which is a fancy term for Magnetic Resonance Spectroscope Imaging, or MRSI. I would like to use this opportunity to share with you our progresses in solving several challenging problems associated with MRSI to achieve high spatial 
and temporal resolutions in clinical settings. Here is a brief outline of my talk. I believe most of you here are not directly working in the field of MRI. So I'll begin with some high level comments about biomedical imaging and MR spectroscope imaging, highlighting some opportunities and challenges to provide a context for my talk. I will then discuss our work going through the underlying ideas, concepts, methods, and experimental results without getting into the nitty gritty technical details. I will also share with you our experience and perspective in this research endeavor, which might be of interest to you. Hope that is useful. Let me begin with these slides. As you know well, last century was filled with great scientific and technological breakthroughs, although we are still struggling in getting the pandemic under control in this new century. And this list of engineering wonders was created by the US National Academy of Engineering at the turn of the century. As you can see, imaging technology was considered one of them. Biomedical imaging is an old field. Believe or not, the art and technology of photography were known to people back to 1870s. So, Pei, I don't see your slide, Adi Vanson. We are still on the outline slide. Oh, really? So what happened? <laughs> So your slides stay on the outline. Oh, no kidding. Maybe unshare and share again. Okay. So you will not see my slides at all. No, I don't so see the slide. I can see it. Yeah, take your time. Okay. Uh, so we, we still don't see your slide. Are you sharing? Uh, let me try again. <laughs> I saw electric engineer. I don't know how to do this. We try this. Okay, let me try again. Screen two. It's coming. Can you see? Yeah, we now? see your first slide. Go, go down. Yeah, move. Yeah, now it's moving. Good. That's moving, right? Yeah. Okay. So I already covered this. So let me say, so biomedical imaging is an old field, believe it or not, the art and technology of photography were known to people back to 1870s. That was a long time ago. Uh, biomedical imaging as a scientific discipline began with the discovery of the X-ray by Röntgen in 1895. Over the last 120 years, biomedical imaging science and technology have progressed significantly, revolutionizing biology and medicine with enormous societal impact. But biomedical imaging, I may say, is also a new vibrant field because imaging science is going through a paradigm shift 
and the range of application has greatly expanded from traditional anatomical imaging to functional and molecular imaging, from traditional diagnostic imaging to image-guided therapy and intervention, etc. Molecular imaging has been a hot topic in the field of biomedical imaging for the past three decades. Funding agencies and industry have spent tons of money to develop effective molecular imaging technology to understand and detect diseases at the molecular level. As a result, many molecular imaging methods have been developed, but most of them have to use molecular probes or molecular reporters of one form or another. MR spectroscopy imaging, or MRSI, promises to provide molecule-specific information without using molecular probes, without using molecular reporters, by using intrinsic spin signals. And this is the topic of my talk. Spin is a basic physical phenomenon. In fact, if you wish, at the fundamental level, God gives us only three things, mass, charge, and spin. Both mass and charge make it all the way to the macroscope level, so we can feel them and we have accepted them for centuries. But spin was not discovered and accepted until the 1920s. We all know the famous Stank lab experiment from our physics course. When these two gentlemen shot an atom beam through an inhomogeneous magnetic field, the beam split instead of staying together or getting blurred. So there must be another force in action. Subsequently, the cancer of a spin was proposed by several famous physicists. But in my humble opinion, Paul Dirac provided the most beautiful theoretical justification. When he reformulated the Schrodinger equation for electrons, taking into account the relativistic effect, spin automatically came out of the Hamiltonian operator right here and part of it. And this equation also predicted for the first time in human history, the existence of antimatter like a positron, which turned out to be true. And now positron emission tomography, a pad, is a premier tool for molecular imaging which is part of the, the topic of my talk. Spin everywhere at the microscope level. Electrons have spins. As you know, chemical and biological processes are electron events at the fundamental level. So electron spin could have been a wonderful tool to study chemical and biological processes. But unfortunately, electron spins cancel out at the molecular levels because of Pauli exclusion principle. Luckily, perhaps at the mercy of God, most nuclear eye have spins especially those play critical roles in biological systems and biological processes, such as hydrogen, carbon, phosphate, you name it. Nuclear spin can do wonders. Using the spins in the water molecules, we can obtain these beautiful images from the brain, from the heart, from the breast, you name it. And this is what MRI is about. These capabilities have revolutionized medicine and biology over the last four decades. 
But spin are not limited to water molecules. Using spins in other molecules, we can obtain this structure, which can be one dimensional or multi dimensional, which are very useful for determination of molecular structures. And this is in the domain of MR spectroscopy, which is widely by our colleagues in the chemistry and biochemistry department. MR spectroscope imaging, or MRSI, is a beautiful integration of MR spectroscopy and MR imaging. So in contrast to MR anatomical imaging, here at the, each individual point, we obtain a spectrum, which can be one-dimensional or multi-dimensional. These spectra provide molecular information of local tissue. We are using molecular pro, we are using molecular reporter because of the chemical ship effects, decoupling effect, etc. So MRSI provides a unique capability for non-invasive, let me say non-invasive, label-free molecular imaging. MRSI has a wide range of potential applications for basic science research. MRSI has the potential to allow us to study various metabolic pathway in biological systems and enable us to gain an understanding of various diseases at the metabolism level. There are numerous potential clinical applications, including early detection, diagnosis of diseases, such as tumors, neurodegenerative disorders, psychiatric diseases, etc. Assessment of therapeutic efficacy of various medical procedures is also important potential application. The potential of MISI, in fact, has been recognized for a long time. Some of you may know Nobel laureate Paul Lauterbrunn published his first paper on MISI in the conference proceeding in 1975, only two years after his MRI paper in Nature. For some reason, his paper went unnoticed by the scientific community. Almost 10 years later, in 1982, Truman Brown published a famous paper on MRSI using face encoding. The technique is widely known as CSI, chemical ship imaging. And this paper stimulated a lot of interest in MRSI, which was largely responsible for the rapid development of the field in the 80s and the 90s. Over the last three decades, many brilliant researchers in my community have done outstanding work to push this difficult field forward. But unfortunately, the capabilities of state of our MISI technique are still rather limited, with spatial resolution on the order of centimeter and scan time on the order of half an hour. So practical applications have been rather limited. There are several major long-standing technical obstacles to obtaining high-resolution MISI data. First, cursor dimensionality. MISI increases the dimensionality of the imaging problem by adding one or two spectral dimensions. Using conventional imaging technique, the number of measurements required for a given resolution grow exponentially as we increase the dimensionality of the imaging problem, thus leading to a very long data acquisition time. Second, very low signal-to-noise ratio. 
metabolite concentration often several orders of magnitude lower than that of water used for MR and atomic imaging. And third, huge nuisance signal from tissue water and lipids. And here is an example. As you can see, the proton metabolite spectrum is completely buried under the water signal. Given these problems, it has been very challenging to perform fast, high resolution MISI experiment in practical setting, especially in clinical settings. This might be of interest to you. ISMIM conference is the premier scientific meeting for MR research with about 6,000 attendees each year. This plot shows the percentage of ISMM paper on MISI. As you can see, the 1990s were perhaps the golden years for MISI research. At the each peak point, a quarter of the ISMIM papers were on MISI. We now have witnessed a continual decline of interest in MRSI for more than two decades. At the 2015 ISMI meeting in Toronto, barely, barely 5% of the ISMIM papers were on MRSI. So you can imagine most people, most my colleagues, give up on MISI. So if you want to have highly cited papers, forget about doing MISI work. I, I fell in love with MISI because my postdoctoral advisor, Paul Alderberg. I'm very happy to say, after many years of effort, inspired by Laudable's vision and ideas, and my student and I are finally getting close to making rapid, high-resolution MISI possible using a new technique called SPICE, or spectroscope imaging by exploiting spatial spectral correlation. And here's a quick example to illustrate the capability of SPICE the NAA map using state-of-art CSI or chemical SIP imaging technique with the same data acquisition time. And this is what spies produce. As a reference, and this is the molecular imaging map uh, obtained using PATH, but you have to use the radioactive isotope to obtain in that. Spice is based on subspace imaging. Without getting into the nitty-gritty details, let me just say high dimensional image functions often reside in a very low dimensional subspace manifold because of sparsity and susceptibility. Exploiting this fact enables us to significantly accelerate the imaging process. Partial stability developed by my group here at Illinois may not be very familiar to you, but it is the mathematical basis of SPICE. So let me say a few words about it, although I know it's going to be boring, all right? Conceptually, partial stability is very simple. A multi very function is separable if it can be decomposed as a product of univariate function. We often use this trick to solve differential equations. However, strict separability is usually not valid for representing general image function. Partial separability is a nice generalization of strict separability. In this case, the function is decomposed into a sum of partially separable functions. For example, 
spatial composability, and which correspond to lowering matrices. Or high order partial susceptibility corresponding to low rank tensors. There are a lot of interesting math behind this decomposition. For example, partially separate function against in Hubert spaces. And of course, in imaging, nothing goes beyond Hubert spaces. And Hubert spaces of higher dimensional functions can be expressed as tensor product of Hubert spaces of low dimensional functions. And also for imaging, we are dealing with so-called KD space signal coming from support limited function. Then the, the KD space signal is an entire function of exponential type. And that's a mathematical uh, term. And local susceptibility extend to entire K space, which is very nice. This slide may convey the concept a little bit better. And here uh, is the high dimensional spatial spectral function, which has a large number of data points, measuring all these points in high signal to noise ratio, will take a long time, uh, which is impossible in practical terms or in clinical setting. However, it can be justified. Each of these spectra can be decomposed into the weighted sum of these spectral basis function, with weighting coefficients being spatially dependent. The number of spectral basis functions is small because we have only a small number of distinct compounds, our tissue type. More importantly, these special basis function can be predetermined, can be generated using quantum mechanical simulations and a little bit of machine learning. So this model allows us to make major changes on how MRSI data are acquired and processed. More specifically, for data acquisition, and we have successfully implemented a number of unconventional features. Uh, we are boring you, let me just say, how to shock T and shock TR, no water lipid suppression, sparse sampling, spar sampling KD space, and acquisition of navigators for tracking magnetic field in homogeneity and object motion. As some of you may know, a sparse sampling of short TRs acquisition can significantly reduce the data acquisition time, and while short TE acquisition help improve a SNR. Um, our data acquisition scheme actually impose very significant challenges for data processing. And fortunately, after several years of hard work, uh, we have managed solving most of these problems. One key element of our data processing method and is the use of the subspace in mathematical framework. And here, each molecule has its own subspace span and by a set of pre-learned spectral bases coming from quantum simulation and training data. Another key element is the effective use of unsuppressed companion water signal for correction of fuel inhomogeneity, fuel drip, and subject motion. There are a lot of nitty-gritty engineering detail, I may say, but our decision and effort to tackle the problems from end to end from physics to machine learning was a key to our solution of the problem. By solving this problem jointly, we, they actually become much easier to our surprise and also to the surprise of many of my colleagues. I have to admit, it has been a long journey to get spies to work. This was our first simulation result obtained in 2007 using experimental data 
from Mike Feiner group at the GCSF. And as you can see, we were able to reproduce the spatial spectral distribution with only a small fraction of the master data. But it took us several years to get the whole imaging scheme to work experimentally. Here are our first experimental results obtained by my former PhD student, Professor Fan Lam, and in 2013, uh, while he working on his PhD thesis, from a phantom containing metabolites of physiological concentration. The CSI scan, as you can see, took an hour to acquire and this spatial spectral distribution. The EPSI scan, which is an accelerated version of CSI, took six minutes, which is great, but the result was too noisy to be practically useful. SPI scan also took six minutes and produced this result, which are comparable to those from the long CSI scan. So you can imagine how excited we were when we obtained those slides, those results. But our first conference paper was actually rejected by IASMIM, which usually accepts 75% of the submissions. Rejected by IASMIM? <laughs> it was rather demoralizing especially to my students. So you can imagine, I had no mood to cook dinner that day. So I went to a Chinese restaurant for dinner and got this fortune cookie. It was amazing. It helped. Then my student and I kept working on it. The next year, uh, our paper was accepted and we got a best uh, conference paper award. And our journal papers have gotten more attention afterwards. And I even got perfect score for my NIH grant. You know, NIH reviewers are usually very tough. So it was very encouraging that they say our proposed work was extremely significant and highly innovative. It was a breakthrough technology that could enable 3D and MRSI translation to the clinic. And in retrospect, they were correct. And we have successfully carried out 3D MRSI scans of the whole brain in clinical settings in collaboration with Professor Zhao Li at the HHU. A quick summary of the key features for SPICE. Most notably, we achieve three millimeter isotropic normal resolution in contrast to one centimeter using the state of our existing technique. And our scan time is about five minutes instead of 30 minutes. This localized spectra provide a spatial map of individual molecules. For example, the spatial map of NAA and STUS party, uh, which is good biomarker for neuronal integrity. And spatial map of creatine, a good biomarker of tissue energy metabolism. Spatial map of choline, a good biomarker of cell membrane turnover, is a good indicator of malignancy of tumor. Spatial map of myoinastal, a biomarker of astrocytosis, or cell membrane damage due to traumatic brain injury. And spatial map of glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter. And glutamate is a good biomarker of neurological or psychi psychiatric diseases. I may also say because of the data acquisition scheme we propose, and we can use the unsuppressed companion water signal to do a lot of exciting things. And for example, we have successfully 
obtain myelin water flux map from the unsuppressed water signal. This map is useful for characterization of demyelination and white matter diseases. And in addition to the myelin water flux map, we also obtain uh, the QSM quantitative susceptibility map using the unsuppressed water signal. QSM maps are widely used in my community and for, as a marker for micro, micro bleeds, iron deposition, and oxygen metabolism. And here is a clinical result from a cancer patient by Dr. Zhao Li's group at JTU. And as you know, many imaging technologies are available and capable of detecting the presence of tumor. But differentiating different types of tumor is a challenge. With spectral information, this has become much easier. These are the spectra from normal brain tissues and this are from brain tumor. You can see the reduction in NAA in the tumor region because the loss of neurons. We can also see an increase in choline, and which indicates this is malignant tumor. Spies also detected the presence of lactate, uh, which was produced due to the well-known Wobber effect in tumor. And here is the experimental result from a stroke patient and obtained by, again, Professor Zhao Li's group. And as you can see, our technique can detect the loss of NAA or neurons and also the presence of lactate due to anaerobic glycolysis. And this molecular information is useful for both assessment of tissue viability and the selection of intervention procedure for acute ischemic stroke. Dr. Lee's group has also successfully carried out a clinical study of TBI using SPICE, which produced the encouraging result. And as some of you may know, for mild TBI traumatic brain injury, there are often no visible lesions in structural scan. Um, but SPICE uh, detected the metabolic alteration, which seemed to be consistent with the medical understanding. And this is such an encouraging result from Alzheimer patients, spectra from health control, from the low A beta area, and from the high beta area. You can see the metabolic alteration detected by our method. MISI, of course, is not limited to hydrogen nucleus. We have also extended the spice to phosphorus MISI. As you may know, phosphorus MISI has many important applications, especially for studying energy metabolism. But the sensitivity of phosphate MISI is very low. And here is a set of represented results obtained uh, from phosphorus MISI scan of the calf muscle. The phosphine create, phosphate creating maps and the localized spatula operating using conventional method and our method, respectively. And you can see the tremendous improvement in SNR. We have also extended the spies to deuterium MISI. These are the results from conventional method. Very, very noisy, very noisy. And this from spice, which clearly show the metabolic processes and actually dynamic metabolic processes of deuterated glucose, uh, glutamate, and lactate in tumor of a rat model. Um, as I said earlier, MRSI has a wide range of potential applications in both basic science and medicine. So we hope with further development, SPICE will make these possibilities to become a reality. Before I conclude my talk, 
let me make a couple of high level comments. First, computing wonders. You all know that computing is a key element of modern imaging systems. It is amazing computing technology has been improved by nine orders of magnitude since the invention of MRI. Cray too, introduced in the mid eighties was the darling of the computing world. Its computing power is barely comparable to that of an iPhone 4 you have thrown away a long time ago. Some of you may also know with advanced computing and machine learning technology, AlphaGo be all top human players, which shocked the world in 2016. A reasonable question for us, what will imaging system look like? So we have unlimited computing power. As you know, imaging science at each core is a data science. It's all about data acquisition and data processing. And it lets data speak for themselves. However, biological systems are very complex. For example, we have 100 trillion cells in our body. Each box of one millimeter cube has a three million cells and each cell has 100 trillion atoms. It's virtually impossible to have sufficient metadata for the data that cell review all the processes and interaction in such a complex system. Model science, like physics, on the other hand, has had enormous success in generating and predicting rich physical and biological phenomena. I believe synergistic interaction of data science and model science enabled by powerful computing and machine learning technologies may give future imaging system new capabilities to allow us unravel the mystery of biology. Talk about biology. We all know 21st century is touted as a century of biology, if not pandemic. <laughs> biology research has also been progressing at an amazing pace in recent decades. The Human Genome Project was completed in 2003. Induced pluripotent stem cell was discovered in 2006, which ushered in a new era of cell reprogramming. As you know, Professor Ken Lance Group at Columbia has done wonderful work in this area, and he gave an ins very inspiring talk here a few weeks ago. Effective gene editing technology has also become available, which was selected as technology of the year in 2015 and received the Nobel Prize last year. So the question for us, can MRI benefit from the biological revolution? Can MRI help celebrate biological revolution? Can MRI further transform healthcare by leveraging the biological revolution? Spins have provided us a special window to peer into chemistry and biology. We have already done so much with the spins of water molecules. I believe the spins associated with other molecules and metabolites will allow us to gain deeper insights into the biological processes. Such information is properly integrated with genomic and other omics will get us closer to achieving the goal of precision and personalized medicine. To conclude, I want to thank my wonderful students and collaborators who make the work I presented here possible. I also wanted to point out 
most ideas came from my late advisor, Paul Lauderburg. To that, he didn't live long enough to see the exciting result we are getting. I also want to use this opportunity to think of my special happy friends, their amazing accomplishment and their special friendship have been a great source of inspiration for me. Last but not the least, I want to thank Professor Sawyer Wood. It is his vision, his leadership, his hard work that has made that be possible, which gives me the opportunity to speak here. Rugby is a very special community with extraordinary talents in many areas. I firmly believe by working together, we can make a difference and we will make a difference. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Professor Liang, for your inspiring talk. You demonstrate your persistence to push MRSI technology to reach such to such a wonderful success, innovation and breakthroughs, and with many clinic applications. As always, your lecture is engaging, <laughs> and we also really appreciate your strong support of Wackby. Uh, so now let me put up my slide. Thank you, Jumin, for the very kind comment and have a great mentor like uh, Savio, Cam, you and all those friends. And as I said, you guys have been a great source of inspiration for me and, and, and it's been fun. Yeah, thanks. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, next, uh, WACB webinars in May and June next month we will welcome a Professor Hongwei Ouyang from Zhejiang University. He will present uh, all for one in the multiple disciplinary research of cartilage and the tendon generation. Uh, in June, Professor Zongzu Gan from the University of Oklahoma will lecture on biomechanics from blood flow to hearing. Please plan on joining us again for this highly uh, expected uh, lectures. Uh, also, a reminder about the WACB World Congress on um, Bioengineering number 10. So it will take place in 2022 uh, at the uh, in Shenzhen, China. Uh, more details will be available later this year please now plan on uh, submitting your research work to this Congress. Now uh, back to the uh, question and answer. Please uh, add your question again, reminder to the Q and A area. So we will try to answer as many questions as, as possible. If uh, your question don't end up addressing, address the, please feel free to reach out directly to Professor Liang, his email is on this slide. Um, so I'm sure he will be happy to discuss with you continuously. So let me unshare my screen so we can put uh, back our speaker up. All right, so quest questions. Uh, so we may, so we have a question and answer box. Um, yeah, I can, I can. Yeah, very nice. Like wonderful um, talk, uh, Zipei. I got really educated <laughs> by your like starting, 
like spin, right? You said the mass charge in the spin as three elements of the wonder. So for your spin uh, one, but a lot of decoding from the like uh, Schrodinger's equation or some other sophisticated like uh, mathematical models. So my question, because we are just the users, I, I didn't really use the uh, um, MRI as non-invasive one. But my question is, you said, um, I, from my knowledge, I think nowadays the highest resolution of MRI, even though it's very non-invasive, uh, convenient, not convenient, expensive <laughs> technology, but the highest resolution for my knowledge is roughly like a uh, hundred micron, right? Per pixel at this time, right? So yes. how, from your, uh, uh, expertise, how can we improve the resolution? It's the, uh -huh. uh, the technique, like by this, like probe or something? Because it's label free, you said, this is label free. I <laughs> mean, it's by some chemicals uh, inside our body. Then how do we, how can we improve the resolution? That's an excellent question about resolution. And certainly uh, for imaging uh, resolution, signal to noise ratio and acquisition time, they all mix together. For in terms of the ultimate resolution, it really depends on the application. If we do microscopy, take the sample out, and then we can actually achieve micron resolution. We can do that in high field. But for clinical application, that's a different situation. We, then then we, we cannot scan the, the patient for a long time, the object motion and all that kind of things. So for, for most structural imaging, function imaging, we can achieve millimeter resolution. And that's also the target uh, we have uh, for uh, molecular imaging or metabolic imaging. And also that's pretty much the conventional wisdom. At that length scale, and, and pretty much whatever you detect, more or less, okay, I hope the biologists and all this will, will, will not say I completely wrong on that. It's pretty, pretty much reflect the biological function. Since physiology and biological function is not the action of individual cell, it's really a collection of cells, right? So many times people, even uh, for some of the technique, we do have the capability to reach lower, uh, 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 higher resolution, but we never use it in the clinical setting. And uh, so to answer the question, what will be the, the, the highest resolution we can achieve? We can actually achieve micron in, in, in vitro situation. In clinical setting, it pretty much uh, on the order of millimeters. Thank you. Uh Dr. Liang, uh, a question from uh, Yuan Feng. Thanks, Professor Liang, for this wonderful talk. Spice is really amazing. Could you explain a bit more on the integration of the sparsity and the partially separable properties together for imaging acceleration in spice? Excellent questions. And spice is not amazing, it's very spicy. <laughs> it's a little bit involved. Um, and as I mentioned during the talk, we have wonderful, very talented research in my field. They have done wonderful work. But for a long period of time, uh, people tackle the problem at the component level. Physicists try to work on the physics side of things. And, and, and data processing people work on the data processing side and so on and so forth. Then we took an integrated approach and using the subspace in mathematical framework. So in fact, if you just use a, a partial separability or sparsity and those model, like what people do, like in compressing and so on and so forth, you will not be able to obtain those spatial spectral a distribution we were able to obtain. So the key to 
obtaining those results is actually from the very beginning. The way we do the spin excitation, the way we code the spatial and spatial information, the way we de do decoding and so on and so forth. So how each individual style <laughs> uh, we implemented, that, that's quite a bit involved. So the, the, the high level message is, is a, it need to be an integrated approach, and we should never sacrifice physics for the sake of simplifying the data processing. And that's what we did for a long period of time. And you can imagine like in the 80, 90, computing power is very low. Then we designed the data acquisition scheme more or less to make it easier for data processing. But now, hey, we have unlimited computing power. Then we can ask from the first uh, from the first principle, what will be the way to obtain maximum amount of information from the spin system, and then let the mass and computing and all that kind of things uh, take uh, uh, take care of the, the the data processing problem. So that's yeah. what. And even that, that was a lot of work, particularly because uh, like the water signal, lipid signal is four order magnitude higher than the metabolite. Uh, so any mistake you make over there, you, you, you destroy the molecular signal. That's one of the reason early on when we when I told my colleague, hey, this is what we like to do. Uh, some of my famous colleagues said, you must be crazy. You don't even have the dynamic range to cover that. But then we showed up and, and of course early on the US, as I mentioned, our way first conference paper was <laughs> rejected. That's a, that's the first time we got a paper rejected by 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 our annual meeting. Thanks, uh, Dr. Leon. Dr. Wu raised the hand. Dr. Wu, go ahead. Uh, hi, Zipei. Uh, that was really an educational lecture and very exciting about the uh, possibility for, uh, for the future. Um, I, I just wonder for the, from the practical point of view, uh, the technology re is requiring uh, 3T MRI, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, I'm thinking about how do you how do you envisage the future with most hospitals and and so we won't have that kind of a 3T app, you know MRI available. So is there a way that uh, we can uh, translate your uh, technology, spice technology, to a uh, more common available? MRI, is that part of the potential solution or uh, everybody has to upgrade their MRI to that <laughs> level or, or this is going to be limited to a very uh, specialized center for that purpose. So I just like to hear your vision about Thank you, Samuel, for the wonderful question. Of course, <laughs> thank you again for your inspiration. <laughs> and I have learned so much from you over the years and working together. And, and regarding that, your, your question, yeah, it's for, for spectroscopic imaging, we could try like a one Tesla 1.5, but then the separation of individual molecules will be, become very difficult. The very reason we don't need to inject a, a molecular probe is because we have the frequency access spectral dimension, which allow us to separate our individual molecules. And so that separation is a field dependent. So 3T is actually will be a good a working field strength. Number one, give us the spectral resolution. Number two, also give us the the quantum splitting give us the signal to noise ratio. But nowadays, people also do 17. So regarding the, the availability, acceptability of 3T system, it's really amazing though. Um, in the old days, only limited institution, like uh, in your case, of course, UPMC, uh, 
was the first site to have 3T a, a system. So UPMC extremely well known for having the first a, a, a 3T imaging center and to push the function imaging forward. And so only a limited site uh, had it. Uh, UPMC, Harvard, Stanford, the Cleveland Clinic, and so on. But nowadays, it's pretty much everywhere. And, and people say that the number three T system in, in Beijing or Shanghai or, or in Manchester City is probably more than the rest of the US combined. It's truly amazing the accessibility. So I would imagine. Uh, particularly as people are using more and more using a 3T for other scan, then will be more widely available in China, certainly reach the county level. Since it's actually kind of funny in China, right? They, having a 3T is more a, a symbol of the stature for the hospital. So they have the resource and money to buy. And in the US, um, like, for example, here in the university town is a small town. We do have large patient population and we do have this, uh, 3T. And by certainly to another lower level and the accessibility a little bit more limited. But the price is coming down is about $2 million or so. Um, but if you, people really wanted to choose a, a metabolic imaging, then particularly studying the brain, most likely they will try to buy the, even the higher end machine and the 70. And that is very limited. They're about a, around the wall, about 40 or 50 of them available, I believe. I hope I answered your question, sorry. Yes, that's great, that's great, yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Those that are when the Dr. Liang. So, uh, that's all the, the, the time we have for today. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Liang again, and also thank you all for attending today's uh, WACB webinar. Uh, be sure to register for the next ones. And uh, with that, uh, please enjoy the rest of the weekend and the last uh, spring season. Thank you all. Thank you so many. Yeah, thank thanks, Zubay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful, Beautiful Zubay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Yeah, bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Have a great bye. day. Thanks, Happy Easter, thank you. everybody. Bye. bye.